Hi everyone, welcome. Just letting in a few more people. Right. Hi everyone. Welcome to this evening's event run by Newcastle Cathedral. We're really pleased that you could all join us for this evening's panel discussion about protecting our regional treasures. So my name is Danny and I'll be supporting with the running of the event tonight. Now, just before we begin, there are a couple of housekeeping points that I'd like to run through. So first is, I'm sure that some of you will be really used to online events by now, but we'll be keeping an eye on the chat so that if you need anything, you can send me a message there privately or you can send a message that everyone can see. To change who sees your message, you just open the chat box by clicking chat at the bottom of your screen. And then in the to field, you can select Danny, stage manager, if you'd like a message to come privately to me, or you can select everyone to send a message that everyone can see. If you're having any technical troubles during the event, just send a message to me privately and I'll be there to help. Now, just when everyone's come into the event, we've muted everyone just for the start of the session, but there'll be plenty of time at the end to ask questions. If you'd like to know how to do this later in the event, I will show you when we get to the Q&A. There will be talks from our three speakers this evening, and then the Q&A will be after that. So please do note down any questions you have, and you'll have the opportunity to ask them later. You can also pop your questions in the chat if you have them as we go, and we'll be keeping an eye on that. Now, you are really welcome to keep your videos on during the event, as it would be really lovely to see some of your faces. I can see some of you have them on already. Um, just do remember that if you keep your video on, that it is on and that we will be able to see you. Um, we'll also be recording the event tonight and the recording will be available to view afterwards. So if you would prefer not to appear on the recording, then you can just switch your video off. Okay. Okay. And I think that is all of our housekeeping notes for the event today. So I'm really pleased to hand you over to Lindy from Newcastle Cathedral, who will be hosting the event for us tonight. Thank you very much, Danny, and good evening, everybody. It's lovely to see you all, so many of you. I recognise some names and there are a lot I don't know, so you're all very welcome. Uh, I'm Lindy Gilliland. I'm the project manager of, from, Durham, from Newcastle Cathedral, and I'm responsible for overseeing this transformative project, Common Ground in Sacred Space. Um, so I'm going to give you a, a short introduction to set the scene. We have an hour and a half, and then I'm going to invite each of our three speakers, really pleased to welcome Anthony Short from Historic Property Restoration, Dr. David Carrington from Skillington Workshop, and Dan Rose from Rascal Design Art and Architecture um, to, to be our speakers this evening. And they're all going to give a presentation using photographs and video as well. Um, and then as Danny says, there'll be a chance to ask questions at the end. So please keep those coming. Um, we also have a number of polls that we would quite like you to join in with, might keep you awake as we go through the evening. Um, so uh, just to kick off really, it'd be really nice to find out where you've all come from today. So Danny, could we have the first poll please? Absolutely. So in this question, which you should see on your screen now, we're just asking where you're based. So the options are northeast, north of England, um, elsewhere in the UK or outside of the UK. So we'll just give that a few moments so people can submit their poll responses. I think we just have a couple more to come in. Great. And there are the results. Um, so we can see that 32 people are based in the Northeast. Um, we have one person from somewhere else in the North of England, eight people from elsewhere in the UK, and one person from outside the UK. So a really nice spread. So welcome everyone. Lovely, thank you, Danny. Just get rid of that screen. So, Talking about protecting our regional treasures tonight, I'm just going to share my screen to show you a few images of the cathedral to set the scene. Set the 
protecting our regional treasures? Well, of course, the principal treasure is Newcastle Cathedral, formerly known as, and still known actually, as the Cathedral Church of St Nicholas. And it's been a constant presence in the city for over 900 years. As England's northernmost church in periods of rest and unrest, connected to the neighbouring castle and to the marketplace, it's been party to a lot of key historical events. It's seen the great and the good pass through its doors. It's been embellished architecturally by philanthropists and it stands today at the heart of old Newcastle as a treasure house of history, worship and welcome. And you can see from the, the pictures that it's very visually rich. We have wall monuments, floor monuments, artifacts. We used to have pews, roof bosses and the wonderful iconic lantern tower. So in this context, that's not moving now, just a minute, sorry. Trying to move my screen down, Danny. Okay, so can you see some, if you move your cursor towards the bottom left, can you see some back and forward arrows? Yep, thank you. Yep. Let's see if they work. That's right, thank you. So, yeah, so in the context of this really um, medieval building, which has been here for so long, the Common Ground in Sacred Space project is about sensitively remodeling the interior and the exterior. So here we have the, uh, the nave stripped of its pews uh, earlier last year. And uh, we're also remodeling the lands and re-landscaping outside with a, a wonderful terrace um, and accessible walkways and attractive grounds that are outside the cathedral. And the purpose of this sensitive remodeling is to create a space fit for purpose for visitors and for the community whilst at the same time protecting and preserving the historic fabric of the building and the artefacts within, and especially a spectacular collection of ledger stones. And we have over 150 of these, which David will talk to you more about later. We've been fortunate enough to attract funding from the National Lottery Heritage Fund and a large number of trusts, foundations and private individuals. So if you're attending this, this, this event this evening, um, a big thank you to you. At the heart of the work is a conservation plan and a rigorous permissions process to undertake the capital works and our uh, applications have been re reviewed by the cathedral's fabric commission and the cathedral's own fabric advisory committee and other statutory bodies and if you want to know more about the project we have many blogs and other news articles on the website now at the heart of this project is um, and it's it's certainly the largest remodeling since Nicholas St Nicholas became a cathedral in 1882. A project of this nature and scale would be no easy task at the best of times, and we've had the additional challenge of a pandemic. So over the last year, builders' yards have closed down, materials have not arrived on site, architects and engineers have not been allowed to cross the border from Scotland. Designers have had, had to adapt to solving problems on Zoom instead of on site, and contractors have bravely worked in masks and hard hats, unable to stay two metres away from each other, so limited to certain work bubbles and certain areas on site, and they've worked tremendously hard to keep the project going. Along the way, we've been surprised by earlier foundations, hidden tombs, shallow graves, 64 newly revealed ledger stones and drains which didn't run where we expected them to be, to name a few of the challenges that we've had to overcome. And on this slide you can see a very um, shallow coffin which is upon another coffin upon another coffin and that's the cathedral archaeologist on the left uh, doing a full recording of that feature. We had a hole that, fit, that appeared in the middle of the nave which revealed a void and the tombs down below of family vaults. And uh, the drain that I mentioned, we had to have another archaeological excavation to cut to, to check the archaeology where a drain had to run across the old car park through the churchyard um, and loads of charnel bone came up from there. Now, 18 months ago, the cathedral came, became a building site rapidly. Uh, over 50 Victorian pews were stripped out and we found them all good homes in public buildings and in private houses. Boilers, doors, porches were detached to be carefully refurbished. And in this central picture, you can see the old uh, porch uh, at the front of the image, the decoration there, the longest strip is a replica of the original woodwork that had got damaged and that's being carefully restored. Um, 
apart from refurbishing big artifacts like this, delicate objects like the organ and the font have had to be wrapped and packed away to protect them from fluctuating temperatures, from damp and from dust. Uh, other artifacts have been removed altogether, such as the military colours. And the conundrum here is, fun, is actually, it's funny because we felt duty bound to preserve and to look after the military colours, to take them away and roll them up. But in fact, they are at the end of their life and the regiments release them to the cathedral to disintegrate and to die. But we feel duty bound to protect them. Other protective measures include only excavating to 700 millimetres in depth to avoid burials, and burying friable, illegible ledger stones for future archaeologists and conservators to return to with better analytical skills and equipment than we have today. So tonight we'd like to share with you a number of examples of how we're getting on in transforming and protecting this um, incredible space and irreplaceable venue with its artefacts. We also await a new commission for the cathedral which will become a treasure in its own right in the future. So with us are Anthony Short, site foreman, uh, Dr. David Carrington, uh, the cons conservation company Skillingtons, and Dan Rose, design director, and uh, they are going to tell you more this evening. So I'll just stop sharing my screen. And I'd like to welcome Anthony from Historic Property Limited, uh, Restoration Limited. He's been site foreman on site since last January, a year ago, and he's going to talk about the skills and the problem solving that has been needed on this very special project. So, Danny, we have some slides that we put together for Anthony to speak to, if you could share those. Thanks very much. So just the first one coming up. Anthony, hello. Want to unmute yourself. Yep, is that better? Sorry. Great. Hello, Anthony. Yes. Hi, Lydia. All right. I, you know me. I'm the photographer on the site, and I've been whizzing around with my camera, taking snaps. But tell me, tell me what's happening in these images uh, over a year ago now. Well, at the start of the job, we had a big task of, we had to put a load of protection up on the monuments and the plaques around the building to save them from it getting any dust and any damage on them. So we had to get a, a group of joiners in to put freestanding holding up and a lightweight for screen over the top so that they didn't get damaged, which in the left image you can see there. Um, and the right image is the hoarding on the plaques on the wall, which had to be hung over the windowsills, which the join has designed. So that was an undertaking before we actually started any of the groundworks in there, which was a big, a big job in itself. And how do you fix to the wall when, when it's an ancient building? We weren't really allowed to fix to the wall. What we had to do is we had to find some old the, the joints in the mortar and put just a simple fix in here, just a screw and a plug. Um, but on the the north aisle, what we've done is we've, we've designed an, an overhang with the timber, so it overhangs onto the windowsill, so it's actually not fixed. It's just hanging there, so... But the joint has designed that so, and it's pretty sturdy. It's been there for over a year now and it hasn't moved, so it's done its job. It certainly has. We wouldn't want it to fall off, would we? No. Thanks. Let's have the next slide, Danny. Thanks. See how tatty the building was and how it's going to be changed when we come back. In these slides, obviously, what we're hit, because part of when we first started the project, part of the building was still open to the public. Obviously, with the pandemic, that shop changed, but what we had to do was section the different sections off from the nave to the choir. Um, so we had to get the a mobile cherry picker in, which was a spider crane. Um, and we had to airfix timber to the to the arches and drape the lightweight fish screen down it. Um, but we've put a ribbon in as well. So it's it's made of rope, which is that if you look at the, the slide on the right hand side, it's got three layers of fish screen on there because of the airflow through the building as well. So we didn't want it to be, but we certainly didn't want it to come down, but we didn't want it to be that lightweight. We needed a, a good thick layer so none of the dust would get, get through that area. Okay. Um, and the right hand, the right hand is where, obviously that is above the, I think that's the south 
East transept, I think, where you go into St. George's Chapel and that had to be done the same, but we had to have actually make doorways into the holding as well for people to get through, obviously, into, the, into our working area. And I think I can see the pipe, the pipes of the organ in that image. Um, how do yeah. you think I'm protecting the organ? It is in a similar, similar way, but obviously with that had to be fixed to the wall because um, we were, it was basically we didn't want any dust in the pipes because of the organ. Of you know that it, it's a in musical instrument really, so you don't want any dust at all into there. So that that's actually fixed into the building, so it's airtight. That's right. And organs are also very sensitive to the environmental fluctuations, aren't they? So yeah. we have had yeah. the organ tuner out several times actually to try and maintain it during the capital works. Yeah, they've been quite a few times, yeah. Yeah, to maintain it and check that it's all okay. I think your staff have been deafened on more than Yeah, he was playing actually when we left work today. <laughs> he That's was trying it out again. <laughs> Let's have the next slide, Danny Banks. So I talked about um, artifacts that we couldn't take away and this medieval wooden canopy from the 15th century has been hanging over the font all that time. Uh, it, it goes up and down, but we decided to leave it in, in its place uh, rather than move it to and where it could have got knocked in another you know, fragile storage area. So that's you at the top of the scaffold. Yeah, it is. It's with Louise, the conservator. Um, this was a bit of a head scratcher, this one, because the front cover is counterbalanced. So we didn't want any weight on it because obviously you don't want it crashing down. So we had to come up with a, a lightweight design of um, how we're going to cover it. So Paul Barrett, there was site um, foreman, well, obviously, sorry, he was the site manager at the time. Um, he had to come up with the plan of putting a, a lightweight breathable memory in on, but it was how we were going to drape it down. So he came up with it. It's a, it's a clamp that goes from the hook at the top and then we we'll drain it down. So it, it's, it's, it's worked really well, actually. Um, it was a bit of a nightmare fixing it, to tell you the truth, because we, weren't, we didn't really want to touch it because it's that brittle and old. Yeah. So we were very careful. It took about two to three days, I think, to do that because we had to keep taking the scaffold down and moving it around. We, we didn't want to get too close to it. So, but it's done, it's done a really good job with it. And, and it lets the air flow through it as well at the same time. So that it, the, the temperatures in there don't get to the moisture and stuff doesn't get to it. That's right, it doesn't go mouldy. Let's hope yeah. that's right when we take that cover down. I remember being there the first time you put a canopy up and it, it slid all the way down <laughs> and you had to start. It, yeah, it was a little bit too heavy, so yeah. quite a burst of yellow that one. Yeah. So fingers crossed that will that will look just as beautiful. And then we will vacuum it when when we um, finish the works, it will have a vacuum, yeah. conservation vacuum, and will look uh, stunning again. Uh, next slide, please, Danny. So this brings us on to the main job of, of lifting the floor in order to put underfloor heating down. And you've been very much involved, Anthony, in, in managing and uh, instructing the others and getting involved yourself in lifting and then relaying the ledger stones. Um, I think we have a video that we could perhaps play now just to show yep. the process. I think the video is coming shortly. Try a little bit fast that one. Right, so in this video now you can see this is, we are, we're lifting one of the ledger stones in the south transept aisle, which was in two parts. So to get it out, we had to undermine it to get the straps in, get the airframe over the top, basically get the straps nice and secure, then lift it up. We use bars, timber. Um, then what we do is we lift it into its bit high enough to get a boogie underneath. 
So then we pull it out, um, take it to a, a safer place in the cathedral, then we lay that ledger stone in its new place. And that were, that was the same method we used on quite, well, nearly every every ledger stone there. The smaller ones weren't too as hard to get out, but... Um, I think you had a plan, didn't you, of working around the cathedral, lifting one yeah. set of ledger stones before you moved on to the other, but it became rather... Yeah. So, trying it, to tell it, us it, it all changed because every ledger stone had to be identified before we started lifting, because the, they were all getting rehomed really into a different section of the cathedral. Um, many of them, I don't think, have went back in the original place that they were. So sometimes to get a one ledger stone, you had to lift five and six. Um, and then it was, where do you store them? Because well, we, obviously when we started, we didn't know what was actually underneath them. Like in the introduction there, you have said that we did come over tombs and coffins and stuff like that. So the weight on them, we were very wary of that. Um, and as you, you know yourself, when you, did, when you did come into the cathedral, they were ev absolutely everywhere. The, the floor was obviously covered in them. Um, on chocks, they were, we were put them everywhere we could. But we've la we laid the last ledger stone last week, so we've finally, finally done it. Well but it was a job in itself to do every single one. If we maybe he's lifting two, with, I think on the best day, I think we lifted three in one day. I think I, that's the best we've done because of the, the method to get them out. Very time consuming and, and very onerous for all of you involved. Yeah, it was, yeah. Thanks. Let's just close that video down then and let's have a look at, uh, at the laying of the ledger stone now and your work with that. If we have the slides back. So here are some of your ledger stones laid beautifully in the North Isle. Would, would you like to tell us a little bit about what the process have been? Because we, uh, we don't have underfloor heating under these, the, the heating is in the central zone of the nave, but yeah. down the north of the South Isle and across the crossings, we have these banks of ledger stones um, surrounded by this black surround. Yeah, that's the the standard black stone that we're using. Um, the process of doing this was we had to clear the North Isle first. Obviously, then we had to identify which ledger stones were going back in the North Isle, which were all around the cathedral. So after identifying them, removing them, we had to excavate the North Isle down to, a, I think it was a depth of... 450 mil, because there's a an eco-friendly sub base going in, which is a, it's a it's a gal pole. They call it a lightweight, compressive, bit like a hardcore really. Then we will put a a base of lime creek on top of that. Then we will lay the ledgers on top of that, so that it, it does it does breathe and it is eco-friendly. Um, then once all them are in. Then we laid the, the board out of the standard black round, which is a 20 mil standard black stone locally quarried. So, um, but it looks, I think it looks really nice at the minute. And just tell the me way, about that corner, Anthony, that, that corner. The corners or them are, um, obviously the ledger stones have been damaged before we've started. Um, could have been the, 100, 200 years ago, um, they've had corners taken off, and but we've done repairs on them, which are like an honest repair. So we've just taken a, a standard black, reversed it, and cut it into the shape of what the ledger stone would have been. So you can see that it has been repaired. Instead of trying to repair the ledger stone with this, the same stone, you wouldn't really get it, tell you the truth. Um, but they all look... They all look really well, they look good. Yeah. I think they've done a good job. And it's worth saying that um, the architects and the archaeologists, the cathedral archaeologists have worked very closely together in terms of scanning and recording every stone and laying out, you know, we've got we've got recorded the position for every stone, uh, including those that were too friable to leave on display. The ones that have been buried have also been yeah. recorded. So we have- Yeah, every single one. 
that can match to the cathedral's burial book? Yeah, every single one got done. Um, there was samples of the, the some of the stone that had broken off as well, taken away, so that can get analysed and we'll find out more about them, um, what region they came from, when they were quarried and stuff like that. So we'll find in more in depth of them, which yeah. is it's pretty interesting. So. And one or two had brasses attached as well, I think. Yeah, they did. The, the 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 ones that had the brasses attached have been removed um, and they've been buried because obviously the ledger on them you couldn't really see because the ones with the brass on had been underneath the pews. Well, at least three out of the four had. Um, so we've removed the, the brass plaques and we've set them in the standard black, which is in the south, south transept aisle on the corner. And then them them look pretty good as well. They've got the border with the standard black stone going around them now. So hopefully when it reopens, people will be able to see them as well. Yeah, super, thank you. And I think there might be one more um, slide, Danny. So here's the site manager, Paul Knotts, with some masonry, which I don't think he'd actually uh, worked at that piece of stone. Oh, he didn't, <laughs> he, he didn't <laughs> work about, Tell us about the masonry that you've undertaken and also laying the new paving, which is all quarried locally, as you said. Yeah, um, the, foot, the slide on the left is, obviously, you've just said Paul Knotts, the site manager. Um, the stone that I've dressed there is for the new entrance on the, I think it is the for the new coffee. Mm -hmm. um, we had to take it, it used to be a window so what we had to, we've, we've done we've transformed it into a door um, which new, needed new door jams so we had to replicate the stone that's in and redress it so now it's a doorway instead of, of instead of a window so that's the stone that I addressed um, where you can see the, the mouldings on it there um, that doorway is now finished the central slide is round the pulpit, which me and Paul done together um, because the difficulty of the cuts and the, the mouldings and stuff and it, it, with it being that delicate, we really wanted to do it ourselves. So, but it looks really, it looks really good at, um, around the bottom of there. Mm -hmm. It's it looks really nice. Um, and the right slide is that's the Elza Grey paving. Then paving slabs are just under a metre square. Um, I think they're 50 mil thick as well, so they're really heavy as well. Um, but all stones being sourced locally, you've got the um <clears throat> sorry, the Elza Grey, Standard Black, and the Cat Castle Buff, which all comes from the north northeast. Um, northeast area, and I think Cumbria as well. So it's all so locally stone, and there is a little bit frostly marble as well, which I've made some steps for the bottom as well, which have been made now. Anthony, you've got, sorry, Anthony, there are lots of chat questions coming in, so I'm just trying to cover some as we go along. And uh, right, um, one person is asking, "What have you most enjoyed about working in the cathedral?" We know that you you love his heritage and history. And yeah, um, probably. Buildings. I shouldn't really admit this, but um, I hadn't actually been in the cathedral before we started the job, which I feel a little bit embarrassed about now because it's such a beautiful building, um, and the history of it is amazing for it to be on your doorstep. Um, and some of the ledger stones, when you read them. They were both really influential people in the in the northeast at the time. Um, the archaeologist side of it, I've found as well, where we found of like tombs and stuff like that, and we have found some old stones in there. Um, the foundations, some some of the old foundations as well, has been interesting. So it's probably the history of it has been. Really, really interesting to me, but also the transformation of the cathedral. What we've done to it, um, I think it's it's transformed it quite a lot, actually. Um, so hopefully that people will be able to see it soon. I think we've got one more slide just to show a bigger area of the paving that you've completed. And yeah, we do hope everybody will come back and walk upon this stone floor, which has been a complete building site. Yeah. 
but is now looking really special and smart. Is there one more Just slide? To, there is. Just to quickly jump in, we're um, over time, and I know we've got lots of great questions in the chat, so I hope maybe we can save those for the Q&A at the end. Absolutely. Thank yeah, you. No problem. Thank you so much, Anthony. We no really problem. Appreciate all the time you've put into the cathedral. Uh, no bother. Working on the cathedral, uh, and we have a, we have a poll uh, for for everyone to take part in, which is to do with stone masonry, and uh, and let's just have that one called up, Danny, please. Okay, great. So everyone should hopefully see that on their screen. Um, so our question for you is: Why does a stonemason leave a banker mark? Is it to leave their name as a legacy, to identify how many stones they have dressed so they get paid? or to mark that they have checked the stone. I'll give you just a few moments to share your thoughts on that one. I can see a few faces in deep thought. Maybe Anthony can put them out of their misery. Anthony has a mason's mark, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I have, yeah. It's to identify how many stones you've actually dressed um, so that you do get paid at the end of the job. <laughs> right, so over, over half of our um, attendees today got that one right. So well done if, you, um, if that was your guess. Super, thank you. I think there's one more question. Is that or <clears throat> is there one more, Paul? Yeah, if you'd like it. Um, so the next is, how heavy are the ledger stones? Are they five tons, three tons, or one to two tons? I'll just give you a few more moments to answer. Okay, so we had a couple of people guess five, about 20 people guess three, and 25 people guess one to two. Anthony, can you share the answer with us? It's, most of them are one to two ton, and I would say 90% of them are made of a Belgian limestone, which is a, a dark blue stone. So it's a really dense stone, so that's, the, that's how they're that heavy, really. <laughs> Great, thank you. Brilliant. No Thanks problem. so much, Anthony, and good luck with the rest of the job because we've not Thank finished. You. <laughs> so now we're going to turn to the conservation, and I'm really welcome, pleased to welcome Dr. David Carrington, who is the founder and the managing director of Skillington Workshop Conservation Practice based in Lincoln. And at some points during this project, his poor team have not even been able to find, find a guest house or a hotel open in Newcastle <laughs> to come and do the work for us because you know, everything has been shut for so long. So uh, he's back on site, I think, at the end of this week to start more conservation, but he's going to highlight some of the delicate conservation work that's been carried out, particularly on the ledger stones and our oldest resident, the medieval knight. Um, thank you. Um, thank you. Good evening. Um, I've, I've got some um, I've got some slides. So, Danny, if you can put the first one on. Brilliant, thank you. Well, um, this is really just to re remind me what the cathedral looked like before um, it was covered in scaffolding and, hoard and um, hoarding. Um, but uh, I was quite amused that uh, I think um, I think this white van actually follows me around because every time I try and take a take a picture of a church, the uh, white van appears in front. But um, that was really just by means of introduction. The, uh, the picture I took about ten years ago. Um, so if you can have the next slide, please. Brilliant, thanks. Um, well, again, this is before we started. Um, and it, it's funny how we often walk around um, churches and cathedrals, we're sort of too busy looking up to look at the floor, but um, in uh, at, at uh, Newcastle, in, in particular, there's an absolutely wonderful um, collection of, uh, of ledger slabs, which hopefully will be um, will have the opportunity to appreciate them much uh, 
much more closely after the completion of the um, of the common ground project. Um, now there's a there's a selection here. It's quite interesting to see um, really you know the different materials and also the way that they've been um, been reused. So the one in the the centre of the picture, which is of a um, uh, black uh, carboniferous limestone. So although we might think of it as a as a marble, it's not a marble in the true sense of the word. It's a um, it, it's a sedimentary limestone that takes a good polish. Uh, in fact, in this case, there there's a lot of local stones, and nearly all local. This is probably a Weirdale um, uh, limestone, similar to the uh, Stanhope stone, which has been used for the new replacements. But um, it's been uh, requisitioned some uh, 130 years after the uh, original uh, um, date of death by uh, by Matthew Pryor, who died in 1800. Um, so, uh, yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, so here's, here's um, some more of the different materials we encountered. Um, brasses were mentioned earlier on. The, uh, the slab on the left is another, another one of these black lime to, limestone slabs. Um, the brass actually uh, commemorates a um, uh, uh, Thomas Lorraine, who we are told was a, um, a virtuous, sober, honest man who died at the age of 35 in 1649. And um, it must be one of his um, descendants, say, um, the wife of uh, Margaret, wife of uh, James Lorraine, who died in um, 1781, uh, had her inscription added to it. One of the most unusual stones that we we found was just in one slab, which was this sort of reddy, pinky coloured um, stone. The inscription is very difficult to read, but there's one of these um, uh, heraldic panels or uh, heraldic round or carved in deep relief in, in the middle of it. So, um, uh, it's got very prominent, a very prominent shell pattern in it. And we think that's probably a um, uh, our initial prognosis is that it's a um, possibly a, a marble from Dent in uh, Cumbria. So we're working with quite a variety of different materials. Um, next slide, please. Um, now, when uh, when I took this picture, this was we we had a gantry on site as well, and I won't. won't talk any more about using the, the gantry because we've seen some some brilliant pictures of it um, with um, HPR using it but it, I wanted to sort of emphasize really the size of the uh, the slabs we had to move some about as well um, but the, the, the most main thing here is that I, I took this picture just about a week or so before um, uh, Sort of COVID really started hitting the hitting the news, and it's really just a reminder of, in a way, how challenging the project has been working through the um, the pandemic. And I know that um, although we had a had a break, HPR continued all the way through, and uh, I mean a brilliant achievement, really. Um, next slide, please. So one of our first jobs after the slabs had been lifted and laid out for us by um, by HPR was to was to complete the making it an archaeological record, but more of assessing their condition, um, and um, and also we were looking closely at um, what was underneath and any signs of reuse that might have been um, evident from looking at the sides of the slabs. So uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so um, in conjunction with this recording, we started carrying out cleaning trials. Now, on the um, on the most basic level, we were just looking at removing the the build up of centuries of um, sort of dust and grime which had got into the 
into the surface, particularly in the lettering. And, um, you know, this was just cleaned off using, um, uh, typically using a, um, uh, a, a non-ionic detergent with deionized water and various bristle brushes, but we could also use um, melanine sponges. We're quite good at picking dirt off. Um, but uh, actually things, and that was what we were expecting at, um, you know, at the tender stage when we first priced for the job. But we did find lots more complicated problems than that as, as things moved on. So if we could have the, um, have the next slide, please. Um, th this is a particularly wonderful um, ledger with some, you know, brilliant carving in it, one of the most interesting slabs of all, actually. Um, but um, it was um, it was hidden under um, under a carpet, and somebody um, at some stage thought it would be a good idea to. I mean, I presume this is why it was put on, but uh, some bitumen um, sort of sheeting over it to stop it from getting damaged. Well, of course, over time the bitumen had sort of. Um, uh, welded itself <laughs> into all the carved detail and and it was has been very tricky to remove that <clears throat> we ended up having to use a combination of um, little steam cleaners um, the sort which were actually manufactured for um, for cleaning dentures um, <laughs> but they're quite useful for cleaning stone as well um, and uh, and organic solvents to get the the remains of the bitumen out of the the detail. Um, another problem we had was where some of the ledgers were were found underneath the pew platforms. They had got a build up of cement, more cement and old lime mortar um, slurry on the top, and and that was that was largely removed mechanically um, using scalpels quite often by softening the, um, the, the cement first. So some really quite tricky problems from some quite delicate stones. Um, other, other issues we, um, we had to deal with were um, where stones were found to be in, in poor condition, perhaps they were delaminating or breaking up. We, we, we had to sort of consolidate by introducing um, little mortar grouts into cracks and fissures um, and some of the stones we repaired using uh, hidden stainless steel stitches and pins. So um, next slide please. So this is some of the recording we did. We, um, we went with um, uh, some of the guys from HPR. We went down to um, we had a we had a nice day out at Bath Abbey, where um, there's been a, a a similarly involved project to the floor to the to the ledger stones there, and we looked at how their conservators had been recording um, and making in a in a quick but accessible way a, a record of the condition of the hundreds of, of slabs that they had um, were working on. And we developed this sort of traffic light system for um, helping to give a quick visual assessment of the condition of, um, of slabs and to help make decisions as to whether they could be, um, <clears throat> whether they're suitable for, for, for reuse. Um, next slide, please. So moving on to the night effigy, um, now this is um, this is a picture I took I think in about 2012. Um, for, for years he seems to have been hidden behind um, bits of furniture and uh, sort of covered in sort of centuries of, uh, of of grime and dirt and perhaps not fully appreciated. Um, he um, is thought to be the effigy of um, uh, Sir Peter, Sir Peter Mearshall, or Marshall, I suppose, who died in 1322, um, which was about the date of the effigy, maybe 1320 to 1330. Um, 
we can't be absolutely sure who he is because sometimes you get um, the heraldry carved on the shield in quite high relief. Here, all we've got is um, a bend, a sort of diagonal stripe on the shield, but without any further detail. The heraldry would probably originally have been painted on. Um, next slide, please. So looking at some of the some of the interesting features of the effigy and things that you I'll just highlight to, to, to because they're quite um, some diagnostic um, dating features. Um, he's got crossed legs, um, which doesn't necessarily mean that he was on the Crusades. It was more of an artistic convention, particularly um, popular in the um, late 13th and early 14th century. Um, he's, he's in prayer. His feet rest on um, an, an animal footrest, which, although it doesn't look that much like it, is actually a lion. Um, I, I've heard people describing um, it as a dog, but it is a fairly crude depiction of a lion. And you've got this wonderful little figure. If you can go on to the next slide, please. I'm quite mindful of time. Um, yeah, so this wonderful little figure who's got one hand sort of holding at the, the bottom of the shield and the other hand sort of sort of almost sort of holding the, the sword. The sword is broken incidentally, which is why it's, it was originally longer than it looks now. Um, I had uh, mistakenly described him as, um, as an angel in a previous um, talk I gave on, uh, on the effigy, but he, he's not. He's, um, He's got a hairstyle quite similar to mine. I've been working on it for at least 50 years and finally getting there. Um, but uh, he's, um, he's a beadsman. So um, beadsmen were, um, if you like, people who were paid to, um, to, to, uh, to, to pray for the, um, for the soul of the deceased. And they're quite unusual to find them in this way depicted on, on effigies of this state. But um, if we can go on to the next slide, please. Just a couple of minutes left, David. Yeah, so we'll go, thanks. Here we are. So here's a comparable example um, at uh, Hexham Priory where we're also working at the moment. Um, another, another effigy, quite similar in date, slightly earlier, um, another, quite sort of strange lion and um, another beadsman in a similar position he's had his head um, knocked off during the reformation i should think but uh, the similar sort of idea um yeah next slide please in fact i think now we're on to the video if we've got enough time to run through that quickly yeah i think we just about do elena okay. we're happy to share that so the, the video you're about to see is a um, uh, rather sort of speeded up version uh, account of us moving the effigy out of his, um, his niche. Um, I mean, it's quite a sort of, you know, a bit like moving the ledges. It's quite a sort of a sort of difficult job, but I'm showing this because it's so uh, we use different methods. Um, we couldn't obviously get a gantry over him in the niche, and so it was a case of getting um, carefully lever levering him up and progressively raising him onto wooden runners. Um, and then we built a, a temporary platform uh, next to it, and I'm using, I've got some Teflon sheets, little sheets of Teflon there, and we put two on top of each other um, underneath the effigy. Uh, on top of the wooden runners like that um, and because there's no friction between the teflon we can just slide what is a very heavy piece of stone um, to one side onto the trolley and then um, carefully move him to his temporary position um, back onto another working platform and in fact this is where we are, are going back um, at the end of this week to to move him onto his new um, onto his new plinth in the same way, and then we'll be um, cleaning him and carrying out uh, other other sort of conservation work. 
Well, well, there he is, and and it's wonderful to see. Uh, really exciting to see the the side of him that hasn't been hasn't been visible for for hundreds of years. It's, it's one of the most exciting things for me about what we've been doing there. Um, and shall, shall I end it there, uh, Danny? Just to there's not a huge amount to say about the font. Lindy, you're on mute. Oh, there you are. Sorry, David, thank you so much. That's, um, I think we'll have to invite you back for another session when you've done the <laughs> observation of that of the night and the font. Uh, you can tell us what you found. It's it's frightening to think that the, the night was almost thrown out in Victorian times by, I think, the overzealous church wardens, and now he's going to be the centre of our new interpretation. So we look forward to seeing what you find out about him. Uh, we have a poll, actually, uh, because we know that you think there may be possible traces of, of pigment of colour on this night effigy and we have a poll uh, to ask people what they think we should do let's see what people think if we discover original paint colors following our investigation should they be reinstated or should we leave the night as he is in his current state so if you'd like to vote on that restore him to his original state keep him as he is currently or you don't mind either way Have you got to the end of that, Danny? I'll just wait for a couple more people to vote if you'd like to. Wait, and we'll close it there. So well, well, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because it's it's not it's not like some of the previous questions. There isn't a right or a wrong answer. It's um it, it's I suppose a matter of sort of fashion and um subjectivity but i think at the moment our feeling would be not to uh, not to restore any any color yeah thank you very much david um as i said you're going to be coming back to restore uh, or to sorry to conserve the night but also the font and uh, the story goes that the medieval font was dismantled and hidden from marauding scots in 1639 and it was hidden by another stonemason called cuthbert maxwell who had just witnessed the font at st john's granger street being destroyed so not brought out till many years later, we're now going to, uh, I believe you're going to strip out all the old concrete and the, and the old cement and grouting and have it restored to a, 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 a you know, better condition. And it's also going to be enhanced by a bowl, a bronze bowl for living water. And it's going to be joined by two newly commissioned pieces of liturgical furniture and contemporary choir stalls. So I think every generation leaves its mark on a cathedral's design and architecture. And I'm delighted now to welcome Dan Rose, designer and director of Rascal Limited, who are a, a multidisciplinary multi practice working with artists and architect, ar architects who have won this special commission for the cathedral. So Dan, you waited a long time, but uh, would you like to tell us all about the new liturgical furniture? I would be delighted, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, amazing to see those presentations. It's just the context is just, so fascinating and really lays the press pressure on thick for us, I think. Um, yeah, just want to say thanks again for the opportunity to be involved in, in the project and working with like a really interesting and, and diverse team on the cathedral side. Um, so just as a really brief background for our practice, um, we're a team uh, at the moment, we're 10 full-time staff um artists engineers craftspeople and um, we have a qualified architect um full-time employed and we work with um businesses and creative practitioners to um as a kind of uh conduit between all of the parties involved in a um larger development or um building program to create um, usually what we call the, the, the cherry on the cake, um, you know, an amazing um, structural, artistic, architectural elements that is uh, an embellishment to, to a building. So while we used to work in furniture in our early days, um, we've moved more into larger structures now, but this is very much um, in line with our, uh, our practice in terms of um, that kind of statement piece, that statement artifact. Um, so uh, 
this is the brief that we responded to originally. Um, I think it was very exciting for us to have a brief where there was no artwork, no preconceived um, competition um, interpretation to come back with. Usually we have to do a bit of design work um, as opposed to just text and, and, and words and our, our response, um, which is tricky because until you've met an entire team, until you've really absorbed a project, it's hard to know what, what the right answer is. So it, it was um, really encouraging um, to hear that the the client team wanted just to meet someone that they liked and who had they, they had the faith in who could deliver something that was um, the, the right answer. Um, I suppose what we took away as some of the key elements from the brief were um, with the AMBO that, yeah, it's, it, it, it's a functional piece of furniture that is to be read from and to be preached from, but also the fact that it's kind of a piece of display furniture and that the, the open book would be presented there. Um, so it's interesting that that has its its dual use. Also, the um, the AMBO, the also sorry, um, again, it, it's a, a, a kind of a multifunctional thing. It is the table. It is a, again a place of of presentation and 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 preaching. Um, and it's the challenge of creating something that is sculptural but also has a function is 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 really interesting to us as well. Um, also, this statement from the chapter saying that they want them to be statement pieces and, and majestic and non-standard, and this was was definitely in line with what our thinking would have been, uh, because we're here now at this time in history, in this context, in terms of the design landscape and design language and everything. So we want to do an honest job of of creating something that works well, but also captures um, a, a sense of, of time. And we, we don't want it to be anachronistic or a, a kind of Disney um, interpretation of what this kind of thing should be. Um, and this was kind of us just distillating the brief into some um, some finer bullet points. And um, so I'll take you through some of our visual response. So having met uh, the client side and done a brief presentation of our interpretation, the, these are the kind of the highlights. Um, so we're really interested in the link between in terms of the etymology of nave, um, it has a link to um, the uh, the nave shape is similar to the to the bow of a ship, and and the word naval in terms of sailing and um, nautical uh, elements, and they're they're actually uh, connected in the geometry of those two things. Um, and you can see uh, on the right hand side here just how sculpture and architecture can be. Uh, begin to use some of those smaller details to create something that feels liturgical because you have a, a, an arch shape which just immediately um, carries that um, that sense. In terms of materials, um, we were really drawn to using uh, vitreous enamel or some sort of um, ceramic type finish um, because you can just capture, um, I mean all of these things would have used cobalt as a dye um, and uh, vitreous enamel is a, a powdered dye which is then fired in a kiln. Uh, it melts and then um, when it cools it hardens and then you have this uh, completely indelible uh, material that lasts generations and generations. It's really hard wearing and um, we felt that that would be a really nice thing to incorporate um, either on a large scale or a small, small scale at that stage. We weren't exactly sure how that was going to go, but it's a very honest use of materials. It's using um, in the same way that the ledger stones are just, you know, material that is hewn from the earth. It's the similar sort of narrative and we're, we're kind of against using uh, applied um, finishes such as paint and things, because as David has just said, they don't last and, and they just disappear in, into history. So it's nice to try and make that, that mark. So in the top left there, you can see some contemporary pieces that use uh, the, that sort of color. So we, um, we, there's a lot of precedent for, for using this kind of cobalt color um, in uh, contemporary furniture. And then also um, we really wanted these pieces to have a sense of mystery to them. And um, we know that there's, you know, just so much story that, every, you know, our interpretation of making liturgical furniture is that it is all about story and it's all about telling a story and there's a narrative as people flow through the cathedral, there's a narrative all the way through the Bible and 
th there's so much interpretation and everything. So we wanted to create something that felt um, ethereal, non-specific, and something that people would kind of look at and question what it is and 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 what it does and the thought process that we have have been on as well. And we think that the um, you know the sense of a shrine is something very sacred and holy. And so if these things could do the, if they could follow their function um, and also have the sense of being like a shrine that you, with something warm that would draw you towards them, that was something that we thought would be really evocative and, and, and a really nice addition to the story from, from our side. And um, just the last point on the shrine element, um, that's also very closely related to um, geodes and caves. And we think that, you know, there's, there's a strong um, link in terms of some of the um, Bible stories as well, you know, um, significant events happening in, in caves. So we saw these things as maybe sculptures that are inspired by um, local history and local manufacturing. So we um, landed very early on, on on wanting these things to be cast because um, there's such a, a rich heritage of, of um, foundries and metalwork in, in the Northeast. And perhaps these things could be broken like the sacrament, and within that reveals a shrine or a geode or some sort of natural seeming um, inner core. So stage one, having won the commission, um, which was super exciting, and was basically just to figure out what the design principles are, how big is it going to be, and just the basic geometry. So this um, really early shape, it's a, the first things that you're going to see here are just really throwing ideas together and pulling it around and seeing what works and the, the design process that we take is either you, you have the eureka moment at the very beginning or it's a iterative design process and you you use your uh, internal critic just to keep saying right is that right yes no how about this and just constantly checking yourself and 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 criticizing your own work as you go and as as you do that eventually um, a design emerges and it's an evolution. It's, it's, it's really an evolutionary process. And um, it's really, our, our passion is working with people like the client team, um, Lindy and Jeff and uh, Claire and Jane um, to, you know, help them either if they don't have the language, we can tease the ideas out of them, um, you know, working with them as part of that critic team as well is, is really exciting. So and what we have here is uh, basically it's the altar, it's a table, and we wanted it to cantilever in an interesting way because it, it does something surprising and sculptural by springing out of the floor. Uh, the challenge with that is we have to be very careful about um, how stable it is and whether or not it could get knocked over easily. Part of that is solved in the fact that it's a cast piece and we can add more ballast in the by making the casting thicker at the base than it is at the top. Um, and you can see here we have um, what looks like the bow of a ship emerging. So there's a very sort of distinct sharp um, uh, crease in that cantilevering underhang there. And then we were trying to introduce the um, ambo element and how looking at how those two things could appear to be hugging each other. Um, there's a central spine here in the top left. So you can see if you project the shape of the ambo off the, um, the kind of stubby end of the uh, altar, then they share a spine at that point, and perhaps um, there's a taller element because the, these two things need to function at two different heights. One, the altar is um, kind of like a kitchen worktop height, uh, which because you lean on it with your hands and there it's, it operates like a table. And um, the ambo needs to be a bit taller to support the book. Um, so this is kind of just basically seeing how how can these things be quite playful? How can we try and get some movement and activity in them, thinking about some of the earlier sculptural um, precedents that we had referred to, but no way near um, the refinement that we expect or that we're planning on, just part of the process of, of throwing things down on paper and seeing what works and what doesn't. And then we get towards some, you know, early design schematics just to um have some dimensions approved by the, the the client team and and make sure that we're on the right track in terms of the mass and the silhouette and the footprint of these pieces um so to refine the design um and to start getting the aesthetics closer to what we want having agreed some of the design principles and the mass and everything we we wanted to soften everything a lot and we were looking at um how 
uh, in architecture, you can introduce some, some curving and swooping forms and very much um, trying to capture the evocative sense of maybe a draped tablecloth over a table or capturing movement in in one place in in time, but in a in a solid way using a solid unmoving, um, you know, non non soft soft substrate. And um, there's a quick sketch of kind of the operation of this piece and and how we were beginning to introduce that sense of a shrine into the ambo, and so that you have a preacher standing behind it um, with a book that you can't see, uh, and how how a person could interact with that kind of taller piece. And then back to the uh, altar, how those two things could work together as one common sculpture when they're when they're nested together. Um, also, just some more studies and exploration into sculptures. The real what the real trick that we have is um, it's easy to make these forms look um, like they're very carefully balanced and um, you know with in, impossible cantilevers and things because usually a sculpture is fixed and bolted into the ground with foundations. So um, ignoring the practical side, we were just, this is our design evolving a bit and, and getting a bit more detail as we go. Um, and this was a kind of midway presentation that we did with the team, um, which captured that sense of mystery and mystique and that ethereal kind of non-specific feeling. Um, and we thought this was quite an evocative image um, and it went down very well. So obviously we have the challenge of how do we plant these things to the ground in a way that they can be moved around the cathedral for, for various events and, and modes. Um, and also what this is now hinting at again is that uh, bringing in that um, geode element. So using the um, enamel and um, contrasting colored core as a design feature um, as well as part of the narrative and hinting towards that. And the feedback we had was that um, it was probably too subtle in the altar uh, and and really, we could um, we should try and look at making the the sense of that there being that kind of cave geode element element a bit more strongly. So after a lot of work and trying to figure out how this thing could land on the floor, um, we just came up with this sketch of what the opening of the um, uh, uh, the interior could look like, and how that could kind of bleed onto the floor in 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 a, in a flowing way. And as that's developed into a three-dimensional thing, we have this, um, you know, quite uh, evocative, moving, um, uh, very storm-like uh, structure that could also is both sculptural but can be used as a, a table-like surface. And then as we add some color and detail to that, you can see um, that that kind of cave um, feeling that's being brought to the interior of that. So. Um, Again, this this wasn't us suggesting a final design. It was more the journey and and just seeing how how radical did the team want to be, how uh, modern um, and exciting and unusual was there an appetite for? And this went down really well and actually kind of surprisingly well um, from our side. So which was really encouraging because we were being encouraged to push push the boundaries a bit and what we what we thought we we could do with the piece. But um, there was well, there were some comments that came back in terms of what we um, should maybe change. Um, some members started to see a face in this. Some people thought it looked like a mouth or that it was smiling. And it's funny how after you know hours and hours and hours of sitting at a screen working on these designs, that immediately it might say something completely different to your audience. And it's important to be able to get that feedback. Um, so parking the. Uh, Alter for a moment and going back to the uh, ambo. Um, this we always knew that this was going to be a taller structure. Um, we wanted it to have that sense of defying gravity and and um, being quite a, a feeling like a celebratory uh, item. Um, and this is just some some early development, taking it from that that very early geometrically simple form to something that was a bit more sculptural and soft. Um, so. Having presented those, got the feedback, uh, and then also had a bit of time of reflection ourselves, um, the conclusion that we came to was that we really wanted to take this back from something that was becoming a bit wild to something that was much more humble, um, definitely feeling more like it is kind of hewn from the earth and from natural materials rather than being 
the design on a computer and and um you know uh maybe a touch too modern um so again just looking at other precedents having a look at, at um uh, some existing materials and um thinking how can we bring this kind of back down to earth a little bit but also maintaining that sense of mystery and um uh and, and intrigue and then uh, I think at this stage, what we're calling stage three, we had a bit of a eureka moment um, with the AMBO because we just, you know, absorbed all of that, those ideas, had a, had a fresh look and came up with this um, design for something that really feels like a kind of statement, um, liturgical item. You could imagine this on a smaller scale as a goblet on an altar. Um, it really looks like something that is made to present something, which is one of the key um, functions in terms of presenting the book. One minute left, Dan. Right. Okay. I'll have to. I'll rattle on through the, the final stage then. And um, so, yeah, th this is the altar and Ambo um, starting to share some common design features and materials, um, and then bringing it back to um, a material uh, treatment that is closer to the font. Um, and also in terms of the color of the enamel um, coating. So this is it becoming the final uh, version. Um, what we landed on and, and the real moment where it was cemented for us that this was, was the final um, version and we, we were on the home run was to really maximize um, the open face and, and, and fill that with much, as much of the contrasting enamel um, feature as possible. And here are some shots of some details just which just pick out some of the key contours um, so the, the thing that brings these two pieces together is the fact that they're both appear to be sliced at the same angle and, and then can be brought together so that when you're standing at the right angle you can see how they share that relationship um, and then once once this was agreed basically final tweaks and um, we wanted it to feel more asymmetrical and we really wanted the pieces not to have a sense of the front and the back so this is a, 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 a um, exercise in, in kind of pushing the weight over to one side, playing with um, the cross detail on the top and how that could work, what the scale was going to be. And basically what you're seeing here is the piece is just becoming more and more developed until we get to a final design. Um, then um, this foundry visit and um, part of the process. Um, this is how we're going to control the surface texture through shot blasting and through a very careful process of um, getting test pieces made. Um, so we've had test pieces cast that we're now having a, a color treatment applied to, which is this um, chemical patina process, as well as the um, vitreous enamel detail, and then some in situ renders here. So these are the pieces in scale in the nave. Um, this is one arrangement for um, general kind of visitor days, and then we have um, the kind of liturgical journey from the font and um, looking down the nave um, uh, towards the amber at the bottom there. Uh, so that concludes that part of the presentation. Um, thanks a lot. Just want to say thanks again for the, you know, the opportunity to be involved in, in such a historically significant project and um, means the world to us. And uh, it's been, been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, Dan. It's very exciting. Um, the Dean and Chapter and all of us are incredibly excited that you're, that you're creating a contemporary piece of art which will become a treasure of the future. And unless it gets thrown out like the Victorians used to do uh, to their artifacts, it will, be, it will be with us forever. So yeah. uh, we're looking forward to seeing it arrive on site in July. Um, I'm really, really keen to leave some time for questions because I'm sure people will have lots for you and for our other speakers. Um, so, I, but we do have one one poll actually relating to your your contemporary um, design. Uh, let's just have that up. Thank you, Danny. So the question is: Do you like to see traditional or new contemporary designs in a heritage building such as Newcastle Cathedral? And the choices are: keep with traditional design. I like to see a new design. I like a mix of both, or I don't mind. Because what some people love, others hate. So we expect some controversy, but that's all good. We think. Thanks very much. So I think most people are saying they like to see a mix of both con contemporary and traditional. That's a good result. Yep. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Um,
that brings us to uh, the closing stages. We've got 15 or so minutes for, for questions from our audience. And uh, I think Danny is going to field the questions. Absolutely, I can do that. Um, so I think we've had quite a few as we've gone on. So let me just scroll up to find our first ones. So I think um, this question might be for Anthony. So did you find any monumental brasses either intact or indents? Any what, sorry? Any monumental brasses? Brasses, no, no, there was none. There were, there was ledger stones where you had, we had seen that there was some in, but we didn't find any, no. Great, thank you. Um, David, do you have a favorite ledger? Um, yes, actually my, my well, there are two really, which were the ones which were, um, that you saw that were covered in uh, the the bitumen coating, and I think it was because as we removed the bitumen, all that wonderful detail was revealed. Um, that they were absolutely stunning. Great, thank you. Um, I've got another one for you, David. On what basis did the stonemasons originally select which stone type? Availability from local merchants, or would they have sourced something specific from further afield? Um, how, how long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think a lot of it, bearing in mind the difficulty of transporting heavy um, stone objects in, in the Middle Ages, a lot of it would have been based on, on local availability. Um, having said that, in, in, in Newcastle, you, 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 you've got the, you've got the time to, as, as a sort of major sort of route for bringing things up the coast but um or from overseas but i think most of the stones you we're seeing are fairly um are, are, are fairly local um <clears throat> there's a there's a theory that or a school of thought that the um that after the crusades um and uh, with with the um exposed to sort of decorative stones and marbles in the Middle East, that there became a fashion for, for um, things like Purbeck marble and polished stones to be used in architecture um, in, um, in England, but um, that may have had an influence. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting, thank you. Um, a question for Dan. Dan, do you have a favorite regional treasure? Oh, <laughs> tough question. That is a tough question. Um, do you know what? I, I, it's not really a treasure, but I've always liked the uh, the were rabbit um, above the doorway near the cathedral, and I've always thought that's a, an interesting local feature. That's that's quite unusual. I think but it, uh, the reason I like it so much is because it was found completely by mistake, probably on a night out, and um, yeah, it was just. Uh, just a real surprise and it's it's really nice making those architectural discoveries I think um, when you're walking around the city especially when you're visiting new cities and things and, and anything that has a personal story I think is is a, is a treasure to to you that's the first thing that, 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 that pops to mind. Great thank you Dan. I'll think about it later and I'll come <laughs> up with an amazing answer. <laughs> um, okay I've got a few questions that people have sent directly to me. Um, Vacuuming has been mentioned. How will the overall cleanup of dust from the overall cathedral take place? Is it wash down of fine objects, walls, and floors? I think that might fall to me to answer that. Well, David, you might like to come in as well. But HBR will be doing a major clean, but then we will have to have a deep clean uh, with conservators uh, and others to to be really careful. Va vacuuming is one of the methods that are used, used. Yes, and often there's a, a net over a very small nozzle. And, and then the, particula the, the particles are taken up without actually you know, picking up any of the uh, fibres or uh, loose pieces of stone or whatever might be there as well. So it is a mammoth job ahead of us. Yeah, it certainly looked like it would be from the photos shared. Um, let's have a look. Um, what are your plans to share the findings, the, refurb the refurbished space and the heritage? 
we have lots of plans. I mean, <laughs> this is part of our, our, our activity plan, actually, this event tonight. Uh, but in terms of um, other things, we will we'll be having a series of exhibitions. We have a series of events planned for the summer period. Um, we're also producing a small pocket guide, which will uh, talk about some of the archaeology and the discoveries and the, the fruit project coming to fruition through publication. We have school workshops, which will be shared with schools and schools resources. So there's a whole plethora of, of uh, interpretation and uh, uh, different layers of interpretation, particularly through a, a new um, ledger stone, what we're calling a sound and light show, actually, which will be part of our interpretation and an animation also, which will feature in the cathedral, which will uh, which will um, sort of greater enhance the stories of the cathedral, if not the project. So uh, there's a whole uh, two or three year um, plan ahead of us. Brilliant, thank you, Lindsay. That sounds really exciting. Um, I have a question from Ollie. How will the discoveries about the ledger stones inform your interpretation of them for the public? Will there be future learning about them or research on them in the future? Yes, yeah, so currently we have a, a group of volunteers who are researching uh, ledger stones and, and biographies. A lot of the biographical information is being used in the new interpretation, but it's an ongoing project because we've now got 64 more ledger stones to research. Um, it's been very difficult over the last year because archives have been closed, so we haven't been able to get to primary sources to look at wills and inventories. To, to We've got names and dates. We're desperate to find out more about a lot of these people. So it's certainly a, a project which will continue um, as a research project, which will inform interpretation and future exhibitions and online resources as well. Lovely. Thank you for that, Lindy. We've had a few questions about um, banker marks on the ledges and if there were any on there or Anthony, if you left any on there as well. Um, well, we haven't actually found any banker marks as yet. Um, we have taken photos of the under side of the ledgers, but not to my knowledge, we haven't found any yet. Um, I have left my banker mark on the stones that I addressed for the bottom doorway. So, my mark is on there, yeah. Um, but I think there's a few, uh, I think we're going to put a, a time capsule in as well at some point with a few other banker marks on as well and on the back of some of the, the stones that go down. So there will be a few in there, yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Um, oh, and another question for you, Anthony. What advice would you give stonemasons of the future? Oh. <laughs> and how long you got <laughs> um to tell you the truth it's pretty hard at the minute because there isn't that many colleges that do stone masonry now which is a shame um because they're very far and few between um but i'll just say keep your head into it um dress as much stone as you can and try and do little bits of what we've been doing as well so spread spread it out a bit instead of just focusing on one part of it try and do quite a bit building with the stone as well so you'll be a bank of mason and a fix of mason um also do a bit conservation as well that's an interesting part of it lovely thank you very much um dan is it possible that you could talk about the new choir stalls? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, how long have you got again? <laughs> <laughs> I can give you a quick uh, quick summary. I've got actually got some information here which I can share with you, if you just give me a sec. Great. Um, so this was an added element to the brief. Um, I think this was being looked at as a separate um, commission, but after meeting the team and, and talking through ideas and things, they were keen to see what, what we could bring to this concept. So um, this is a sound recording that um, Claire took, um, which is um, the, the, a, a choral recording. And we uh, they looked at some previous work that we'd done with a, um, a music charity uh, in into um, interpreting sound waves into a three dimensional form. 
So in this image, I've taken the a screenshot that she shared from her recording software, which shows the um, uh, the, the sound waves, and I've traced a, a vector pattern over those um, in uh, a vector design software, um, just to see the um, the kind of organic shapes that you can kind of tease out from this um, from this information, and then um, expanding on that, we can kind of turn that into something that is becomes sculptural and and and, and interesting in a in a graphic way, and then in the bottom here we um, are looking at a, a basically a, a grid because the we're confined to the choir stalls being quite a regimented grid shape because of the way that they function. They uh, there's not there's not there's not room to spare to fit all of the choir stalls that we wanted to, so they have to be kind of quite tightly sized around um, open A4 uh, sheet music. Um, so we're looking at how we could apply this um, kind of wild organic shape to something that was was quite regimented um, and rectilinear. Um, and then kind of how do you actually turn that wave shape into something that is three dimensional? Um, so the approach that we're taking uh, in this case is to um, create 3D geometry, which is the image in the top left, and then slice it into components so that we can actually produce something um, with our machinery. So we're using a, a material called rich light and we are um, basically, what you can see in the bottom image here are um, multiple two-dimensional components. So each one of these slices is, is a 2D part that we're gonna cut out of a 2D sheet material and then arrange next, they're all carefully numbered and arranged so that when they, you put them back together, you get what appears to be a, a flowing three-dimensional form. Um, oh, for some reason I, Oh, sorry, my uh, navigation stopped for a minute. Um, so yeah, then uh, the proposal is to apply that to um, the front of the choir stalls. And uh, what we're losing in this three-dimensional shape is the sense of it being a sine wave. So we've um, kind of st strike through this shape with um, a shelf that gives you that kind of um, zero dB line that you would see on the, um, on the, the original, um, waveform that, that Claire had shared. And then this is basically slowly developing into um, actual furniture and how that wave detail is gonna be continued over the front of those. Um, um, and yeah, it's a, it's a material that was inspired by um, Formica, but it's taken, been taken to a sort of luxury element. And Formica was actually um, designed and is um, manufactured in the Northeast. Um, so yeah, it's been been an interesting um, development that stage as well. Um, uh, yeah, so looking looking forward to seeing that become a reality as well. Brilliant! Thank you for sharing, Dan. It's so interesting to see the kind of design process from concept all the way to what it would um, kind of look like in the end, and how you link that back to the cathedral and its yes. heritage. Um, we only have a couple of minutes left, so before we close off, I would just like to pop a. Um, evaluation form for the event in the chat. It's um, not very long and we would really appreciate it if you would take just a couple of minutes to fill that out. Um, I think at the end there's an option to be added to the cathedral's mailing list. So I know Lindy was talking about all of the future plans they have for um, sharing lots of the um, lots of the stuff that comes out of the work in the cathedral. So if you'd like to be kept up to date with that and with future events and um, future publications and things that the cathedral um, will have in the coming months, then do make sure you tick that box. Um, and then I would just like to finish up um, before I hand back over to Lindy to um, close the event, just by asking one question to all three of our speakers and just give a quick 15 second answer, um, if you please. Um, what, was, what has been your favorite thing about working in the cathedral? Um, so, um, Dan, if we could have you first, please. Sure. Um, just to be to become part of a, a historical process and in a constant evolution is amazing, and also just people. It's always finding amazing people to work with, and it's you know never ceases to, to amaze us. Kind of how much enthusiasm there is, and it's great to be um, imbued in all of that. Thank you, Dan. David. Um, yeah, well, in a way, following on from that, and a, had a similar sort of comment to mine, but uh, uh, 
Uh, yeah, we, we spent a lot of time talking about buildings, but of course, buildings are nothing without people, and it's been a great team to uh, to work with. And so, um, I think it, you know, it's been it's been the people as much as the uh, as well as the buildings and the and the objects. Thank you, and Anthony, please. Yeah, uh, down the same route. Um, working with all the different trades and special subjects in it. Um, especially the conservators and archaeologists um, and really knowing that our work hopefully will be then two, three hundred years time. People will still be enjoying it. So that's the um, best part of it for me. Brilliant. Thanks very much, everybody. We are at time now, so we do have to draw it to a close. Uh, it's my great pleasure and privilege to thank all three speakers, David Carrington, Anthony Short and Dan Rose. Um, I'd like to thank all of you coming, for coming as well this evening. I hope you've enjoyed hearing about some of the detail behind the, the Capital Works. And we really look forward, to, as you, most of you are in the northeast, and those who are not in the northeast, we, we look forward to welcoming you in the summer uh, to tread the, tread the floor. I was going to say the floorboards, but the pavement. Tread the pavement, come and see the legislature collection, look at the interpretation, learn more about the richness of Newcastle Cathedral and we, the team, will be there to support and welcome you. Good night. <laughs>